Hi, my name is Yasmin Svenla. I'm from the Queensland Quantum Optics Lab, and I'm going to be sharing some result, with results with you that we've had with our uh, mechanical setup here in Australia, um, which involves Brewin scattering and strong optical coupling of two optical waves. So um, let's first start with a quick recap of just Brewin scattering in solids. So we have a PEM field, um, regions of high light intensity, your material is going to contract, and so you're going to have this refractive index um, fluctuation and grading, essentially, um, which is going to scatter light. And since the grading itself is a traveling grading, just because of the thermal motion, um, this light is this backscatter light is going to be of a different frequency, and the energy difference is going to be carried away by your mechanical wave. So, so that's what you see here. Um, and so this is the bulk case, the solid state case. And what we're doing is we're using superfluid helium. And you might as well use a uh, bulk wave here. That's actually what, uh, for example, Jack Harris has been doing in Yale. We also have very recently been doing that, but that's a completely different thing that I'm not gonna talk about today. So today we're gonna talk about uh, film thickness fluctuation. So a boundary deformation instead of a bulk wave. And uh, you can see our setup here. So we have a, a micro cavity, a micro disc, uh, it's about 10 to 40 micron in diameter, uh, whispering gallery mode, light waves are trapped here. And then what happens is because of an optical tweezer effect, superfluid is going to be pulled into the regions of high light intensity. And so you kind of compare it here to the solid state case, instead of electrostriction, for us the interaction is radiation pressure really, which kind of makes that boundary really foggy between uh, you know, sort of typical optomechanics and Brio and uh, optomechanics, if you will. And um, the idea is then that by using the superfluid film, which has as a restoring force the under wall force, which is pretty weak, you have a very compliant film, a very compliant system uh, when comparing it to um, a solid, which has, you know, this Young's modulus that you are dependent of. Um, so you're going to get really strong diffraction grading. Uh, with only a, a small force, essentially. So the first big difference is um, pretty obvious, but it's, it has actually big consequences, is that because we use a fluid, the speed of sound is going to be much lower. So in a solid, it may be you know, kilometers per second, while here it's going to be meters per second. And that means that our mechanical resonance frequency is going to be much lower as well. So, well, so here you have just the cavity resonance, and I guess we always want a high Q, so we want this to be narrow. But then in the solid state case, what happens is um, because your mechanical frequency is so large, so it may be you know, 10 gig for a you know, telecom wavelength system, your Stokes beam is going to be so far away from your um, cavity resonance that you have to engineer your, uh, your, the size of your disk to uh, have another cavity mode there at the location of the Stokes beam to make sure that it can be trapped as well and it's also resonant with the cavity. And so this imposes some restrictions on uh, the size that you can, uh, you can scale your cavity to and also just um, what I presume must be uh, some, uh, some fabrication uh, difficulties or just uh, restrictions. So then in the case of superfluid, because the speed of sound is so low, uh, your Stokes beam is just going to fall within the same uh, cavity as your pump beam. And so everything, all the beams, all the light fields in your system are going to be resonant with your cavity um, irregarding, regardless of your device size. And so that gives us some hope that we might be able to um, scale down our system uh, without really these restrictions posed by that resonance condition and maybe even get to mode volumes that are, you know, of the order of the wavelength cubed. Um, yeah, stuff like that. So here you see our uh, experimental setup. We have a sample chamber with a chip with our silica disk in there and we inject helium gas in the chamber and then we cool down through a transition temperature and a superfluid film is just going to form everywhere, cover everything, including the top and the bottom of the disc where you're going to have some kind of vessel mode, um, vessel mode mechanical waves in, um, in your thickness. And so then here, 
uh, for the optical um, for the setup, we are just going to send some pump uh, laser light in and we're going to do heterogeneous detection of the Stokes backscattered beam. So what you can see here is uh, you have a nice mechanical resonance, very sharp, you're at seven meg. And so this is our Brillouin, Brillouin wave or mechanical wave. And then you can see it here a bit more clearly. So what happens is here we have the Stokes power as a function of the info power. And so you really see that at 1.8 um, at 1.8 microwatt, we get into the saturation regime where all the possible pump light is being converted into backscattered light and this uh, very narrow line with uh, Brillouin mechanical wave. And so we are here in this lasing regime, this Brillouin lasing regime. And uh, this by itself is actually quite nice because 1.8 uh, microwatt is, is very low. This particular experiment was not even really optimized to get the lowest possible um, uh, threshold power. And we actually believe that we can get significantly, significantly lower uh, input powers with this. We have already measured uh, PicoA thresholds, but that is not with this mechanical mode. So yeah, so this is just low threshold lasing, but then we want to use this to uh, show strong optical coupling. So the idea is that you have these two, uh, these two optical fields, one is a counterclockwise and one is a clockwise rotating field, and each of those has this Brillouin optomechanical interaction uh, with the phonons, with the Brillouin phonons, and they're characterized by a coupling rate chi. Um, but then you might as well say that effectively you can define an optical coupling rate that tells you what the exchange rate of is of excitations between the two optical waves as mediated by the phonons in the system. And this gets really interesting when we then look at the condition to get into a strong photon coupling regime, which just means that this interaction of exchange uh, excitations between the uh, two photons is going to be at a faster rate than the rate at which these excitations can leak out of your uh, out of your optical cavity. And so for us, that's really what we're interested in just from a standpoint of, uh, you know, optical communication, you know, optical um, quantum communication, storage, et cetera. Um, that is really sort of a, um, we believe that to be a key, a key achievement to that, to that goal. And so that is really what we've demonstrated here for the first time is that this exchange rate is going to be faster than the DK rate, uh, the um, uh, full width at half maximum. So how do you observe that? Um, in the absence of strong coupling, in the absence of lasing, these two optical modes are going to be degenerate. So that's what you see here. And then what happens is we're going to turn on that laser, which means we're going to ignite that lasing process. And then we observe here this splitting. So the initial two optical modes are hybridized into a new pair of optical modes, and they have different frequency. And from the splitting, um, you can actually immediately get your, um, you immediately get your optical, your opt opt optical coupling rate. And so intuitively, you might say that, well, those two optical fields, they're actually physically located, um, they're actually physically pulled apart and so one of them is going to feel the, the thrust of your, um, of your uh, film, of your superfluid film, while the other one may feel the nodes. And so they feel a different effective cavity length, and uh, therefore they have different resonance frequency, which is the splitting. And so we have then measured this uh, optical rate to be about uh, 200 meg, which overcomes the uh, decay rate of the photons in the system of 140 meg. And what I think is really nice to see here is that really the reason that we've been able to measure this in the first place is because our speed of sound is so low because we're really using this fluid, right? Because if this is three orders of magnitude larger than, uh, than this one here, well, you're never gonna be able to measure, measure this in the first place. Um, yeah, so that is, uh, that's the most important. Uh, so we've demonstrated a three volt resonance of um, uh, the optical and mechanical fields in our system independent of the device size. 
we've measured uh, ultra low uh, here 1.8 microwatt threshold for a third sun glazing, and we've demonstrated for the first time a strong photon photon coupling um, in the system. And uh, now for the for the last part, I want to quickly show you some stuff that we're doing right now. So uh, we published this first one. Um, April in nature, you can check that out here. And then um, last month we've uh, published um, sort of a proposal for uh, how to um, increase the confinement of both the optical and mechanical field and actually to increase their overlap, so their physical overlap. Because as you I mean, remember from the, from the picture I showed before, we're actually rel relying here on the evanescent optical field to interact with our superfluid film. And the idea here for this paper is that you're using a slot waveguide, which can give you an extreme, extreme confinement of a very strong optical field in a slot. And then of course, we're gonna fill that slot with some superfluid so that you really have this exact overlap in space between um, where your optical wave is and where your mechanical motion is. Um, and then a second thing that we've been uh, looking at recently, it's uh, out in the archive uh, last month as well, is more just only on the on optomechanical side of things, is uh, that because we're using superfluid, which has uh, the Van der Waals force as a restoring force, this restoring force actually has very strong nonlinear terms. So these are just nonlinear terms in the Hamiltonian of the, um, of the screen constant, really. And so the idea is then that you may actually be able to build a qubit from, um, from an, a superflow film because, uh, yeah, you're just going to have an intrinsic nonlinearity rather than having to couple to an external system to induce this uh, nonlinearity to get a qubit like behavior. And so, yeah, I think that's some really exciting stuff as well to see theoretically, of course. And yeah, uh, if you uh, have any questions, then hesitate to contact me and um, 